On Saturday, I talked to someone, uh, a lawyer, hates her job, hates her profession, doesn't want to be a lawyer, just depressed, miserable. Okay, so we talked. And because of what I'm going to teach you in these next four uh, class lectures, I have certain abilities to which you will also have if you continue to you know, do the exercise and pursue the work. So talk to her, ask her questions, and I figured out exactly in less than 20 minutes what she loves to do, why she hates her job, and how she can be a lawyer instead of quitting it to do something else and having wasted her years in school, and really love it and have her own business and make a lot more money. Okay, so that's Saturday. She's very excited. She's very happy. She's like, wow, this is you know, big weight off her chest and feeling great. So she goes to her job today and early this afternoon, a client comes in requesting to have something done, which is exactly what her new specialty will be. And the boss, the owner of the law firm said, no, 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 we won't do it or it's going to be extremely high. And she got her first customer. So you heard a law of attraction. Right? And does it work? Like, how often does it actually work? Very, very rarely, because they don't teach the whole truth. It's only a part of the truth. Like so many things that are new agey or out there, they give you a piece of the truth. So you believe it, but they don't give you the whole truth. Okay? So with the whole truth of how it works, I call a magnetic center. So we develop a magnetic center, which is like a powerful magnet. But when it's clients, they are attracted to you. So her first client, she hasn't even started it on her own. And the client's already coming to her. It's amazing. And within what? Within a matter of hours, literally from the first working day. And the magnetic center, when it gets so strong, it goes two ways. If it's small pieces of iron, they will come to you. But if what you want is really big, you will go to it. There's a very important part of knowing that when your goal is really big, it won't always come to you. You need to go to it. And the point of the mag magnetic center is it shows you how, what to do, creates events. Now, I'm sure in your life you have already had many events happen that seem good, like something you want, bring you to what you wanted, and you didn't follow it. Is it true? Many opportunities happen in your life that you just didn't take it. Now, you're young. Give it another 10 years. You'll have a longer list. Okay? And that's where people get old and miserable. Now, where I learned about life and what to do right and wrong is not from successful people. Everyone says, study the successful people, right? No, study the failures. I learned from miserable, bitter, angry, old people. And I learned what they regretted. Where did they say, oh, I missed this chance if I did this, if I did that? And I learned what we should do but should not do. Okay, that's one thing. So that's just, I wanted to tell you because that's such a lovely thing that happened already today. Um, and okay, let's see. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay, well, we've already started. Okay. At 3.30, I think we'll lock the door. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so my background is I was born with a certain knowledge, understanding about life, the human mind. So I devoted my life to understanding why we suffer, why we're miserable. Yeah, you can sit on the other side more comfortable. Um, and to solve this problem, to understand why are we 
programmed badly. And where it began, my parents hated each other and fought all the time. Someone's at the door. Okay, someone else coming. It's amazing. We, um, yeah, all right. Hello. Okay, that's a three. So if we have five and three is eight only, that should be it. Okay. Hello. Well, we've already started. So come on in. Okay. Or, yeah, maybe you're more comfortable on that side. You can see. They're close friends, I guess. Like everyone wants to be squishy here. All right. Um, okay, so my parents would always fight. And what I could see is told in a joke I heard what's the difference between a monologue and a dialogue? A monologue is basically one person talking to themselves, and a dialogue is two people talking to themselves. So if you've ever noticed that in an argument, that the two people are, who are arguing are not actually saying the same thing to each other. They're arguing about two different things, two different opinions. They see the same thing differently and, and keep thinking that the other one understands or they understand the other one, but they don't. Right? So I wanted to know, why is it that humans fight? Why do we have problems? Why are we poor? Why are some rich? Why are some lucky? Some are unlucky. Why do some get what they want? And some don't. All of these confusing things. So I set myself a plan for my life where I will, because I was poor, I've had to take care of myself since I'm 13. So I will make a lot of money for two reasons, to buy my freedom so I don't have to waste my time at a job all the time to make my living and then establish credibility. Because if I haven't done it, I can't talk about it. So everything I will tell you, I have done myself, experienced myself, and had my students over the last 30 years also do and succeed. Okay, so this is very practical work. All right, so as I put here, your life is simply action-reaction. This is what we call the law of accident. Everything you do, think, or say is a reaction to something that happened. Correct? Where is there an original thought or an original action in your life? Is there anything that you actually are the impetus of? Nothing, right? You wake up in the morning, why? You've got to go to work. And you eat, why? Because you're hungry. And you want to rest. Why? Your body is tired. And what we're going to learn about is that there are different beings all in one. And there's different aspects to the human being. Did I... Wait, okay. Did, have you all been to see the yoga when I did the talk at the yoga studio? You, you all saw it? You saw it? No? Yes? No? Maybe? I don't know? Okay. Um, so I speak about us being an alien that your consciousness is actually something separate to your body or your personality. So what we're trying to do is become more aware of that alien part of us, which is what really thinks, so we can gain freedom from the controls of our body, of our personality, of the events of life, which make us do all the things we do. For example, if there was no internet or TV, could you have chosen your profession? No. So you didn't actually choose out of total free will. You chose, only because I know what she does, you chose out of a selection of things, not actually creative on your own. So all of us are like that. We don't actually choose out of complete imagination, but we choose out of the, the options available. So our life is always governed by what is available. That means your moods, your emotions, everything about your life is governed by what is available. Okay? Now, a human being is much more than just a human being. We have this consciousness or conscience, and that gives us the and that part of us has the ability to totally control our life. Okay? 
and nobody tells you about that or how to use it. All right? So what happens is this part of you that's born, because you know the most amazing thing about a baby? A baby, newborn baby, can learn any language in the world. Can you? No. I'm terrible with languages. But a baby can learn any language, depending where it grows up. Okay? So that part of us, which is super powerful, can learn, can do things, anything without limitation, gets buried under the programming of what they make you think is real and what you are, and you live your whole life in this narrow channel. Okay? So I have been on my own since I'm 13. I've gone to 11th grade, 16 years old. So I have no education, no family, nobody behind me, no mentor, nothing. But by 25 years old, I owned eight companies. I was a net worth of over a million dollars. By 28, I retired. In all, I've built over 20 successful companies. I've now traveled Kenya's 99th country. I've just booked my trip this weekend to the Antarctica. So I'll have been on every continent on the planet. I'll be over 100 countries at the end of that trip. But who am I? I'm nobody. I, in other words, I'm not from a rich family. I, I'm not educated. I'm not gifted in any way. But what I spent my life doing is getting rid of program, which you are now all still subject to. Okay? So that's what the course is about, gaining that kind of freedom to master your life. Okay? Anytime you have a question, just you know, put up your hand and ask me. Okay? So your life, first rule, your life is action-reaction. There is no independent thinking. You have no control. All you can do is react to situations and circumstances. Okay? So that means you are a robot without any free will. You cannot make any choices. Now you can become more than a robot. So you're not here to learn something. Like you go to school, you go to a workshop, you go to a class, you learn stuff, and then you just accumulate knowledge and information. No, my work is not for you to learn something, it is for you to become something different. Okay? There, and obviously you will learn things, but it's to become something different. Right? So by learning that you're nothing more than the robot, only then you can reprogram yourself. Okay? So, that's the first thing. Now, you know what this, this thing is? It's called the Newton's Cradle. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, oh, why isn't it working? There. Okay. So you see how it works? One ball hits, everything remains solid, and then the other ball at the other end moves. So the point of watching how the Newton Cradle works is that Everything is a reaction to an initial action. Okay. So this first thing you have to understand is that all you are doing is reacting without free will or even knowing what hit because it went through a bunch of solid immovable objects and then it moved you. So what you are reacting to, you may not even know. You may not see. So, a first step is to observe all our actions, thoughts, desires, and think something made me think or feel this. And try to see what it could have been. Not what directly happened, but what happened before it, before it, before it, before it. Okay? Now, the work is like in the dark room, you, you, you put a baby to bed, a kid, you put a kid to bed, turn off the lights, they cry. Monster, monster in the room. Do they do that here? Yes. Okay. You come back in, you turn on the lights, where's the monster? Oh, he's gone now. Where'd he go? Well, he left when you turned on the light. Okay? You're exactly a baby. You're still a baby. You are controlled by monsters in the dark. The darkness is you don't see what's happening because you don't see the first ball that hit because it went through so many other objects until it moved you. So, first step is always remember that everything you think and do, everything is because somewhere along the line, somebody started that motion. 
You brush your teeth? Why? Would a baby brush their teeth on their own? No. Somebody told you. Why? Because they didn't want to spend money on the dentist. They wanted you to have healthier teeth. So why? Because left on their own, without cleaning and good dental hygiene, your teeth will rot. So you see how things go. So you have to know why you are doing something in order to do it well. So if the child says, I don't want to brush my teeth, but if you as an adult know, if I don't brush my teeth, my teeth will rot and fall out. Now I'll brush very carefully. But if I don't know why, I'll just and throw, finish. Right? So everything, you have to think, why do I really do this? That automatically will give you more motivation, more attention to do everything better. Because you know the reason you're doing it. Okay? Or will stop you from doing what's bad for you. All right? You know this saying, everything happens for a reason. Right? Everyone loves that one. But that's just putting the blame onto God or the universe. Oh, okay, I failed. It happened for a reason. I can give up. Well, the reason is you're stupid and screwed up. Okay? So we have to take responsibility for everything in our life by knowing that it didn't happen. It did happen for a reason, yes. But that reason could be a few steps back. And if I don't know the reason, then I am just accepting my fate, accepting destiny, and your life just gets blown like a leaf in the wind. So if you want to master your life, I mastered my life. I've attained complete freedom, emotionally, mentally, financially, worldly, in every way. And if you want to master your life to become a master, then you have to begin with starting to see everything happens for a reason. I need to know the original reason. Okay? Everything. So that's the first thought to be putting in your head. All right. Now, now we get into the course. Those are some things I just added for every time I do the course a little bit different. I always add new things. Okay. This is what you are now. This is a normal human being. You've got four limbs, but not badly, uh, but wrongly put together. So you put your foot in your mouth, you say stupid things. And you can hobble, you can get around, you can survive. You have a job, pay your bills, play sports, whatever it is, but you're sort of hobbling through life, okay? And that's how everybody is, and you don't know it, because it functions. And the worst thing about being broken is if everybody's broken, nobody knows they're broken. So nobody fixes their mind, all right? So my job is to take you apart and show you you are a broken machine. You are malfunctioning. You're hobbling through life. So this means to help you see all the defects in your mind, in your personality, so that you can put yourself back together properly. All the limbs where they should be. But you can put yourself properly assembled until we take apart the badly assembled machine, right? So that's what the, the work is going to show you is all the broken parts of the machine, how they got broken, how to put them back to functioning properly so you can function correctly. Now, when you're the only one with two legs where they should be, two arms where they should be, comparatively to everyone else hobbling around, you're as powerful as 10 people. That's how, 25 years old, I owned eight companies. How can I run eight companies? One person. Because I'm more powerful than 10 people. How can I sleep one hour, two hour, three hours sometime? That's it. And still have power to teach six, eight hour lectures. Because I'm powerful like 10 people. So power, mental power, emotional power, physical power, comes by being correctly assembled in comparison to other people who are wasting their whole life. Okay? So that's the point of the, the course, and that's the long-term benefit, which could take you a few months to really you know, get stronger like any muscle. You know, you've got to develop and exercise it. All right? So what matters most? What matters most in your life? I'd like everyone, if you want to answer, what matters most?
Should I just like make you go one by one? Or? OK. Sorry? My son. Your son. Yes. OK. Your career. What is your career? Yeah. Sorry? Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy. Why does it matter? I like it like uh, if you are not physiotherapy, the way you handle people from maybe they were weak to they were stronger, they were able to walk around just in a day. You uh, but they have somebody who is a specialist and you try to do I like that particular idea. Okay. Money. What? Money. Money. Why is money important? Because I can get anything. Get anything. Anything you want in particular? Um, a Prada bag or what is it? <laughs> um, uh, well, I can't work. Sorry? That you're not lucky? Lacking. Lacking. And so what are you going to do with what you're not lacking? Reaching into, into some, something that I don't have, like having a product. And why would you want that? Because it satisfies my, my ego. OK. Yeah. All right. We'll come back to that one. What about you? I can't hear. I'm sorry. Uh, good health. Good health. Yeah. OK. And so if you have good health, what then? You have no money. You can't eat. Uh, if I have good health, I can go out and work. OK. So you can do things. Yeah. And why would you want to do those things? Uh, to be alive. Just to survive. Like I, I would work to survive, yeah. And what's the point of surviving? Do you know how boring that is? If you're the only one in the planet, the only one in the world? So why do you want to survive? <laughs> OK. Um, can someone have more than one thing that matters? Yeah. So I think family, first. Mm -hmm. Those are my two things. And also, I feel like health, and also, like you said, money could give you a lot of independence. It completes a lot of things for you in this life. And helps the family. You want to skip? Yeah. I feel like I will not echo what she said. Uh, family and health. And family makes me love my children, my mom, my extended family, and money. OK. Yeah. I'm seeing myself. Sorry. Uh. OK. Um, maybe that one there. Easier to see. Hello. What's your name? Eunice. Sorry? Eunice. 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 OK. All right. Sorry. Yes? I'll say, I'll say personally myself. What? You matter most? Yeah. You're a hedonist? You're the only one you care about? Or what do you mean? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Good. I like that's honest, finally. <laughs> if I care about myself, it means I care about the people around me. Ah, OK. So do you really care only about yourself? Like, why do you want to be whatever it is you want? So for example, if you come to my kids with the age of six months, if I'm well up, I can able to support the other people. Because I care about, uh, the other, I care about them. OK. Doris? And if you had all that, what would you do with yourself? Be happier. So you want to be happy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like that. That took some time to think. So then that's probably not enough. OK. 
child, family, helping other people, doing things. Almost everyone is about being useful to other people. Okay? So that is the only reason that we can get motivated as a human being, is so that we are doing something for others and that gives us a sense of purpose. Okay? So now you, 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 if you get clear why you really want what you want, remember, so the, the ball moved. Now what moved you to want money, to want to be healthy, to want to have nice things, to want to be skillful? What moves that? The problem is that all the other balls before that, before the initial impetus, which is our birth, is we want to help. Because in helping, in serving, in benefiting someone else, that gives a human being a sense of self-worth. I am worthy. Now, for I don't have kids, but I know a lot of parents who have kids. Kids generally want to help. Little kids always want to help. One student was a photographer, and one day his six-year-old put all his cameras in a bucket of water. And he went, what are you doing? You know, why are you putting them in water? He said, well, I want to help daddy. I want to wash the cameras. Right? So we want to help. So this is a very important thing to understand is that everything that drives us is the innate need to be useful. So the point is that if you're not happy in your life for any reason, so the unhappiness is the last ball that's swinging, then we have to look back and see if the original cause is I need to be useful, am I useful and do I feel useful and productive in my life? And if not, how can I make myself useful and productive? Or where am I limited in being useful and productive? If I have mood swings, if I am temperamental, if I uh, make big mistakes, if I cannot stay focused, well, then I'm disruptive. Okay? So that is where we're badly assembled. So I'm, I'm sort of just preparing you for the work, is to understand, to get the motivation to say, I want to change what I am. And I need a good reason. The good reason is I want my kid to be better. I want my life to be better so I can do more for other people. Right? You'll find that if all it is is having fancy stuff, that eventually becomes empty. If it is just to have money, to have money, to have freedom. And then what? Okay? That's where law of attraction things don't work. If you want money to have nice things, but you don't know why you want them, Okay? So you must have a goal, and you have to know why you want the goal. But if we took a vote, the majority says, it's a reason for being, that I'm useful to others. Okay? And so in order to be useful, you have to make yourself better. Okay? Okay. Now, um, I don't know if you know about this, but in Indian, like Indian gurus, they say, oh, the guru can touch you on the forehead and give you shakti pat, you become enlightened. There's gurus, big guru, like Guru Mai. She's got, I don't know, tens of thousands of followers around the world. And they all say, they follow her because she can touch you on the forehead and make you enlightened. I said, well, then I asked them all, well, then how come none of you are enlightened? <laughs> okay, so next rule, nothing will happen to you or your life or anything unless you do it yourself. Nobody is going to make anything happen for you. You are 100% responsible for everything in your life, the good things and the bad things. Okay? So you've really got to get that understanding and acceptance of the responsibility to make yourself so that you can be the most useful to others so you can feel or fulfill the innate human need to be useful so that you can feel good about yourself. And the opposite is, don't do things which harm other people. 
You have to do as much good as you can, but don't do anything that harms anyone. So how can you make yourself so that you're the most useful and the least harmful? Okay? So you've got to think about your life, your day-to-day -day life, review your days, review your life, and see where was I useful, where was I harmful? And, and not intentionally harmful. We're not assuming anyone is a nasty, evil person. But just because of your ignorance or your unconsciousness or your unawareness. Okay? All right, let's start to get to the real meat of the work now. Okay? All that's just preliminary, getting you to understand what's the point of, of the work. Okay? Now, this is called the three levels of understanding. Right? Everything you, you, you will understand to one of three levels. You will either have the knowledge, which is a very small bit of understanding, or you will have the vision where you see it. So knowledge is you hear about it. The vision is you see it. You understand it a little better because you've seen it. And the third is the truth of understanding, where you really know what it is. Okay? So now as you review your days and you go forward, whenever you talk about something or listen from somebody else telling you something or you repeat something, you have to question yourself, is it that I know it by the knowledge of it, just I've heard of something, I read a book, or is it the vision, I've actually seen it, or is it the truth of it? So I can tell you about the pyramids in Egypt. If you haven't been there, yeah, I heard about them. I can show you a picture of them. And I can actually take you to Egypt and you can look at them from a distance. But until you go inside the chambers and you go like I did, walking inside the pyramids in Egypt, only then will you understand what it really means, the power of them. Okay? So... Just as a, a story, there is one fellow, I was at one of these social events, like 10 people at a table on a social event, and this guy is talking about uh, Malaysia. And he thinks he knows all about Malaysia, and he's talking about, talking about, talking about, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, I lived in Malaysia for eight years. I know this country, I've seen every bit of it. And what this guy is saying is, just doesn't make sense to me. So everybody at the table is listening to him because he's speaking with such authority and thinking they're learning about Malaysia. And I asked him, how long were you there? He said, two days. And where did you go? He said, just in Kuala Lumpur, the main capital city. So he knows nothing of the country. But he had vision, because he was there. And then he spoke with knowledge. Everyone got knowledge. And now you have a table of nine people, not me, who believed all these wrong things about Malaysia and will now go and repeat it. Make sense? So you've got to now start to think about everything you know and anything you talk about going forward. Are you spreading misinformation because you only have knowledge or vision? Or do you have the truth? Okay? So if you say things that are not true, you know you have failed and are harming. You're not helping. If you tell your children things which are not true and they believe it, you are harming, not helping. So we have to learn to always see the truth of things. Now, what if I tell you about Hamim? What is Hamim? Hamim, what is it? Confusing, huh? All right. And that's how we have to take everything with what is it? How do I find out? All right? So, hamim is food. It's chicken and rice cooked with some spices, Arabic spices, and you cook it overnight, and the chicken is just melting off the bone, and a beautiful smell, and it's the most delicious, one of my favorite meals. It's an Iraqi dish. So now you have knowledge. So now if you go out and someone says, would you like hamim? You'll say, Okay, I know it's food, and I know it's chicken and rice, uh, but I have no idea if I saw it, what it would be, right? So you have knowledge, which is useless, isn't it? Now, if I cook it and show you, ah, now, if you ever see this dish, you'll say, ah, I know, this is hamim. But now, I want you to tell me about it. Can you? 
You can only describe the, the image, right? So how much of your life do you only stop and think you know? And you're very limited in your knowledge of life. But now if you eat it, now you have the truth of understanding. Now you have the right to talk about it. Okay? So start to take that attitude for everything going forward. Don't talk about things and don't believe things just by knowledge or vision. And anyone you trust must have the truth before you believe what they say or think you understand it yourself. Okay? Because what is wrong with our life? We have so much negative imagination. That's where we get into fights, we get into problems, we waste our energy. And the language of lies is the language of negative imagination. So negative is the opposite of positive. So if your life is not perfectly positive, it means you are believing a lot of lies. So there's a lot of negative imagination. And you have the opinion, yes, this is how it is. Okay? So, when we stop believing anything we hear, anything you hear, and you only believe when you have had the truth of understanding, means you have personally experienced it for yourself, this will totally change how your mind functions because you will always be speaking from a position of reality, of facts, of knowledge of what it really is. And then you'll speak with better authority, then you won't mislead anyone. But you will not be misled, okay? Again, all of this is preparation for the actual machine that we're gonna explain about, all right? So remember, if there is any negative imagination, any negative thought, so from now on, anytime you have a negative thought, about anything, you have to remember, no, this is a lie based on knowledge of understanding. But if I can get to the truth of understanding, I can't have any negative imagination because you can never argue with somebody you understand. Think about that. If, you, if, if we're arguing, we disagree, but you really understand, or I understand what you mean, even though we're arguing about it. I can't argue. I could disagree. But if I understand your opinion, your view, if I really understand how you see it, I can't argue. So opinions are the problem. So we need to eliminate all negative emotions. And every time you have a negative emotion going forward, stop yourself immediately and say, okay, it's because I only think I know, or that person thinks they know. I need to look deeper to find out what the truth is. Okay? Now, words have power, right? Words have meaning, words have power. Everyone thinks so? Yeah, another one of the lies that they tell you that is misleading you into negative imagination. Words themselves have absolutely no power whatsoever. Si je parle français, tu comprends pas de français, je peux lui dire que tu es toutes les grandes vaches, entièrement fou, il n'y a pas de chance en vie que tu fasses un succès, c'est bon avec une souris. Right? Any negative feelings about that? Any positive feelings about that? What are your emotions to that? Nothing at all, right? I said, you're a bunch of big fat cows. You're completely stupid, all of you. There is no chance in the world that any of you will ever be a success. And I'm all saying it all with a smile. So do words have power in themselves? Absolutely not. So words are a knife you put on the table. But then you, with your imagination, Thinking you understand what I meant, but not really understanding, pick that knife up and stick it in your own heart. Nobody can hurt you with words, because words, I just proved, have no value in themselves. It is only in your imagination, the interpretation 
of what you think the words or the speaker means, which gives it that power to cut you. Okay? This alone will stop you from ever getting hurt, insulted, angry, in a fight. Because anytime someone is insulting you, uh, manipulating you, putting you down, complaining about you, you remember those are words. I don't really know the truth of understanding of what that person really means or feels. I'm stopping at the knowledge of what I think those words mean with my opinion, which is lies, because I don't have the truth. Therefore, negative imagination. Therefore, I picked up the knife and stick it in my own heart. And as soon as I've stabbed it deeply enough and I'm in enough pain, I'm going to take it out and stick it in their heart and attack back. Right? But if I know that everybody is in pain and suffering, true? Everyone. Who has no pain and suffering in their life other than me? Everyone. Yeah, because I'm free. I have absolutely nothing wrong with my life. The only thing I'm missing is I'm missing a lot more students and teaching more often because that's what I enjoy most. Otherwise, I have nothing. I have money, freedom, health, two very good passports. I can do anything I want. So I have absolutely nothing. Who has no pain? Because even rich people, I'm not that rich, but why do I have no pain? I knew when to stop. Rich people, oh, they suffer a lot. I know very wealthy people, billionaires, and they're miserable because they want more and more and more, right? So everyone has some pain for something or another. I want this, I want that, I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't want this, I don't want that. So what happens when you are in pain? You hit your foot on the table or something. What's the first thing you do? You scream, right? You vent your pain, right? So if everybody is in pain, but I cannot yell at my children, at my boss, at my partner, at whatever. I'm waiting for an opportunity to vent my pain, right? So if somebody is yelling at you, giving you shit, putting you down, saying how terrible you are, and that's the knowledge, and you leave the knife on the table because you know you don't know the truth, of what they really are trying to say, and you know that everyone is in pain and needs to vent their pain, you leave the knife on the table, you understand the truth, everyone's in pain, they can't vent it, happens to be you they're venting at. But it's not about you. So there you go. And now you can never be hurt, insulted, or angered again. Instead, you receive with compassion because you know they're suffering. They're venting their pain. Okay? It's like the two Indians. They're in the store bargaining. One is bargaining. And the shopkeeper says to him, he says, you're cheap. And he says, thank you. And his friend said, he called you cheap. Why are you saying thank you? He said, well, the word was cheap, but he meant frugal. He meant I'm a good bargainer. I'm frugal. Even though he said cheap, he meant Frugal, it's a compliment. See? So we can take whatever people say in any way you want to interpret it. But the problem is you've been taught that those words have meaning, they have power, and therefore they hurt you. But as I showed you, words have no value or meaning or power on their own. It's up to you. Okay? So now we go back to, are you taking full responsibility for your life, for your emotions, for your mood swings? Okay? So, all you have to do anytime somebody is attacking you in any way, verbally, of course, not physically. Um, well, even physically, they're still in pain, but obviously that we don't put up with. Um, but verbally, is remember, they're suffering, they're in pain, you don't have the truth of knowledge of what's going on in their life, therefore, you just accept that like you are in pain, they are in pain, and you have compassion for them. And the exercise to prove this, to make that sink in, 
is observe every time you get angry at someone. Every time you get angry, you yell, you scream, you give shit to someone, any moment of anger, observe, do they really deserve what you have said? Or are you overblowing your reaction? Right? So look at yourself doing the same thing, and then you'll start to understand other people. All right? So you can leave the knife on the table or you can stab it in your own heart. Everyone loves self-pity. So now we have to know, again, like the balls that's swinging, I'm reacting negatively. Why, why, why? Very simple why. I want attention. Everybody wants attention, right? Do, does anyone not want attention? Or do we all want to have somebody showing us they care about us? Yeah? You want someone to show they care? You want to feel cared about? Yeah? Okay. Now, if you walk around and tell your friends, ah, life is great. <gasps> oh, I've got all the money I need. The job is great. I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm traveling. Everything is wonderful. What are they going to say? Usually they'll say, oh, good for you or something, right? But if you come home or you tell your friends, my boss is such an ass and he was giving me shit and he was complaining about that and I didn't do anything wrong and he's just giving me trouble. What do the friends do? Oh, let me take you out for a drink. Let's go for dinner. Oh, I'll give you a hug. Come on, don't feel bad, right? You get a lot of attention. So if we all want to feel useful, we want to feel valuable so that we help, so people can say, thank you, you're useful. So we get that need of companionship to know that people care about us. If we are suffering through self-pity, because we picked up the knife and stick it in our own heart, we'll get a lot more love and attention and care. Maybe even presence. Okay? So do you see how you are making your life miserable? How you are making a lot more negative emotions, pain, suffering in your life than actually is necessary. And you're doing it from the original cause I need to feel worthy, and I feel worthy when people care about me. And if I don't get enough of this love and care and attention, I need to get it somehow. And I learned from watching TV, movies, my parents, that if mommy is crying and mommy is suffering, daddy usually comes and comforts her. I don't know about in Kenya, but in Western countries. That's the way women get what they want. Yeah. Oh boy, my mother got presents like you wouldn't believe. She got fur coats, she got jewelry, she got holidays, she got all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the guy, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's how it works. Okay? So to whatever degree you have learned that, that's part of what broke the machine and made you badly assembled. Okay? So you have to know why you love to suffer because that self-pity gets other people to comfort you and what you need is to be comforted. So instead of this long chain of unknown events driving you to have mood swings, to get angry, to get miserable, to get into fights and arguments, find the original cause and go directly for that. In other words, realize that what you want is to be loved, which is all a human being wants. Okay? To be loved, you need to feel worthy of love. If you feel like a horrible, nasty, stupid, selfish asshole, who would love you? I mean, if that's how you feel about yourself, right? No one's going to love you. So you need to feel good about yourself so you feel worthy of love that you really need. So that's why our understanding of the machine of our mind is so important so we can function in a way that we feel proud of who we are. I am a good person. I am productive, useful, whatever it may be. I am worthy of being loved, admired, and respected. And so therefore, I can accept it when I get it. And I know that's what I want. So the opposite is, I'm emotional, temperamental, whiny to get 
the love I need. So then I know I'm not a good person, so I don't deserve it. So even if I get it, it doesn't satisfy me because I know I'm not worthy of it. You follow? Okay. So that's why we have to fix the machine. So I know I'm a good person and I accept the love out of admiration and respect rather than out of self-pity, trying to get it through that, you know, just let people feel bad for me by me always getting into fights and problems. And this is why a lot of people have these disaster relationships, uh, can't keep a job, always have money trouble. There was one person, she make a lot of money and then oh, car accident, destroyed her car and she didn't have insurance. There goes her savings. Works again, makes a lot of money. Oh, there was a medical emergency or something. Oh, again, cycle goes again. Oh, my parents needed uh, a new house, whatever. So her whole life was make money, lose money, make money, lose money, make money, lose money, because she didn't feel worthy of it. Okay? So where in your life do you have these repeated events of fights, of breakups, of losses, of things like that? It comes from the subconscious feeling not worthy. So that's what we will fix in these um, four lessons. Now this one, is it playing? Shows you about what happens to us as kids. Oh boy, did you do that? <laughs> now that kid is going to grow up to be obese, probably, because he's going to eat everything in sight. And he's going to be totally scared of, I don't know, grandparents or whether that's his mother or his grandmother. And he's going to be completely messed up and he'll never know why. Do you agree? Now, how messed up are you and do you know why? Because he's not going to remember this, unless it's still on YouTube by the time he grows up. But you, how much has that exactly, how many things have happened to you that you don't know? Like I said, the beginning is I'm taking you apart, right? I'm trying to show you how broken you are by showing you how you could have become broken. So you need to, if you can, go back to your parents, aunts, uncles, and say, did you, you know, you can get this video and say, did you ever do anything like this to me? You know, and find out if you can, where are things? Like, for example, I was always scared of knives. And one day I, in my 20s, I'm visiting my mother. She's cooking or in the kitchen and she picks up a knife and she says, I don't know what it is, but I'm so scared of knives. And because I do this work on myself, I went, aha, I'm not scared of knives. She is. And as a baby, she instilled the fear of knives that she has into me. And so I grew up scared of knives, never knowing why. So every fear you have is because somebody gave you that fear through no fault of your own. And you were too young to know why or what, okay? So the next thing to take going forward is every fear, inhibition, limitation, opinion, every single negative limiting thought, because the good ones we don't want to change. Every negative one came from somebody who had that fear and you copied, you learned. Just like the baby who's able to learn any language in the world. We learn everything. Okay? So your exercise from this lesson is list every fear, every inhibition, every limitation you have. List every single one of them. And then interview your family. Or go back and think. Who can I identify as I grew up had this same opinion or fear. 
Okay? And as you identify who that was, you'll realize, as you're doing this work, I'm not really scared of heights. I was scared of heights. I was very scared of heights. Why? My mother was scared of heights. So you know how I fixed it? I learned to fly an airplane. So I can fly planes. So I learned to fly a plane because I was not letting myself be limited by an inherited, implant, implanted fear. Okay? Everything. Fear of water. I overcame that. Fear of knives. Fear of heights. Lots of fears. Because I said, where did this fear come from? A baby doesn't have fear. So somewhere along the line, they screwed me up. And they screwed you up. Okay? Every fear, limitation, inhibition, opinion, every negative thought, racist thoughts, prejudiced thoughts, everything. My mother, Jewish people are not allowed to use electricity and a whole bunch of things on the Sabbath. Okay? So I said to my mother, Mom, when I was little, how come we cannot turn on lights and do things, but people who are not Jewish can? And she said, oh, see, they're not Jewish, so they're going to burn in hell anyway, so they can do whatever they want. And I went, okay, end of religion for me. <laughs> what kind of a stupid thought? Now, she didn't, she wasn't born with that thought, right? Someone had to teach her that thought. So you see where racism comes from. You're not racist, um, if, uh, somebody who's racist. They're not racist on their own. Someone teaches them to be a racist. So when someone is a racist, you have to know that they're just a robot programmed that way. And therefore, you are a robot programmed with everything you believe. We have to take it apart. Everything about you You've got to analyze and see, is not real. You like yoga. Why? Somewhere you got introduced to yoga. If you were never introduced to yoga, you wouldn't be doing yoga. Okay, you like it. It's good for you. Fine. But the point is, it came from somewhere. Everything we do came from somewhere outside. That first ball that hit that caused the reactions. Okay? So... You have to examine everything about your life, every, especially all the negative opinions, so that we can rid ourselves of these negative energies, okay? Now, here's another thing. You're not really you, okay? So I've spoken about that baby no name. When you're born, you're baby no name. You're nothing. And then they make you into whatever you are, okay? Now, if I look at you, you could be Kenyan, you could be Nigerian, you could be, well, I mean, maybe you would see a difference, but, right? Or you could be an American, and you're all black. Except, believe me, there is nothing African about an American black. They're totally different kind of people, okay? So, you are based on where you grow up. Your race, your religion, your culture, everything about you depends on where you grow up. But you're born baby no name. So the example is, and I use Donald Trump because everybody knows Donald Trump. If little baby Donald at one day old was born, same parents, same hospital, his birth is identical. But at one day old, they took him and sent him to India. And he was adopted and raised by parents in Bombay, Mumbai. Donald would be a total Hindu. He would be speaking Hindi. He would be a Hindu. He'd be a vegetarian. He'd be nothing American. Huh? But he'd have the same body. But it'd be totally Indian. Not even English talking, probably not. You see? Does that make sense? So then who are you? Who are you really? And every opinion is a cause of pain. Every argument is a cause of the opinion of what you know they meant. Ever have that argument with someone? And say, I know what you mean. And they say, no, you don't understand. Yes, I do understand. Right? Has everyone had that argument? I know. And they say, no, you don't understand. Yes, I know. Knowledge. No truth. And there you have an argument. Okay? So, there's nothing real about you. Everything about you has been put onto you 
after you were born. Okay? So if you want freedom as a cloud, remember the mountain and cloud. Did everybody know about the mountain and cloud or any not? Do you know that about the mountain and the cloud? No? Okay. So everyone wants to be a mountain. You want to be important. You want to be respected. I am a mountain. I'm important. You have to respect me. I have my boundaries. You cannot cross my boundary. You can't say this. You can't do that. You can't come on my land. No. And if you do, I'm getting angry because you cross my boundary, right? If I say something you don't want me to say. But the problem is when a plane goes into a mountain, everybody dies. And that's basically when two people fight. It's an argument. There's no good that comes out of an argument. But rather, I think we must all become like a cloud. A cloud is always changing, always adapting. When a plane goes through the cloud, nobody gets hurt. Not the cloud, not the plane, not the passengers. And the cloud, you cannot catch it, control it, contain it, destroy it, make it. A cloud is totally independent because there is nothing solid like a mountain, which does not change unless you put dynamite. But a cloud is constantly changing, adapting to the humidity, to the winds, to the environment. When a cloud is low and it hits a mountain, it goes around the mountain. It's adapting. So that's what we need to be, to be able to adapt. You cannot adapt until you know why you are what you are, which is how you were formed, okay? With all these opinions. So, um, you can you still see that the camera is running, right? Okay, good. So you can listen to this recording again and again, and you can review the, the exercises, all right? So, knowing that by observing a baby, and seeing how the baby becomes what the parents and the environment make into that baby, you have to remember, like the little boy, you have been programmed and you've got to overcome this to become you, not who they made you become. All right? So that you can um, become free. Now, basically, you know glass, you can smash it, crush it, melt it, and take the same glass and make it a totally different shape, right? The dish can become a cup and a, or a window or whatever. A human being is the same. We're exactly the same. It's a little bit painful to be crushed and melted, but if you will go through that by basically allowing your opinions to be wrong and uh, doing the exercises uh, to transform yourself, you can totally reform yourself into something completely different, okay? I was formed, like every child, copying my parents, my father. My father was a nasty person. I don't like him. He's rude. He's arrogant, egotistical, narrow-minded, uh, thinks he knows everything. Nobody likes him. And when I was young, I saw I was exactly like him. Because, you know, as a baby, you don't know what's right and wrong. You just copy. And when I was about 12, 13, I realized, oh my gosh, I am a rude, arrogant person just like my father. So I said, I can't live like this. So I decided I have to kill myself. But then luckily I'm intelligent enough to know that if I kill myself and it's a mistake, it's too late. But if I change and it doesn't work, I can kill myself later. So I can keep changing. So it was from seeing that I am programmed by the environment, the person I grew up around, and realizing, I don't like this. I destroyed my ego. It did take many years. But I destroyed all one by one the fears, the arrogance, all these characteristics. And then reformed myself. And it was fun. A few years ago, I went back to Montreal and I went to, it was a dinner party with a bunch of cousins. And um, afterwards, one of my cousins told me, she said, you know, everyone said, what happened to David? He's nice now. <laughs> because I was such an arrogant, my cousins all hated me because I was such an arrogant person, just like my father. They hate my father too. Um, and they said, wow, what happened? He's completely different. He's a nice person now. Okay? So we can transform if, if you want to. And the point, the motivation to go through the difficulty of transforming is because you want to help your child 
your family, other people, so you feel useful, therefore worthy of getting the love and companionship you need. Okay? See all the dominoes that are all in line? We need to know every step that is involved so we have the motivation to change, to put in the effort. Okay, now let's see here. I don't know who said we should be three till seven because that's really a lot of time. We'll never need that much time. Um, so that's all the uh, preliminary work before we get into the actual model of the, the machine of the mind, okay? So let me just start with the first two levels of the model and then we'll have questions or something. Now, there's I think six, six or seven levels to the model, parts of the machine, okay? The first two parts are very, very simple. Everything is an event. Whatever happens is an event. You hear something, you see something, you smell, taste, anything that touches any of your five senses is an event. Okay? But before I proceed, do you have any questions? Anything you want to talk about so far? See, I'm not a professional speaker in this. I talk about what I've learned and how I've been able to try and convey it to other people. Okay, so it's for me quite serious because it's the transformation of a human life. Um, so I'm not here to tell you nice things and make you feel good. I'm here to make you uncomfortable, to make you dislike yourself so much with the understanding that you can totally change to guide your life to any outcome you wish. Right? So like the glass, we've got to crush it, melt it, and reform it. But you have to do that. All right? So, um, yeah, so you'll forgive me if I'm not beautifully fluid like professional Tony Robbins or whatever. Okay? So, yeah, so anything we want to talk about up to now so far? It's all perfectly logical and makes sense. Do you disagree? I like people who disagree. Not for the sake of disagreeing. But if you disagree with anything and you have a good argument as to why I'm wrong, I like that. So don't be shy because then we can either correct a misunderstanding or I can learn something new. Right? No disagreements? I have a question. Yes. So how, uh, let's say like, um, you have to take on how you react to pain. So how do you not react to Okay, so do you have an example of a thing? Let's say somebody, for example, like a bad experience. Somebody um, disrespects you. Um, so you say it is in your best interest. You don't react. You just assume that the words should not hurt. How do you do that by not taking the action? Okay, so we look at it by seeing what because what happened is someone insulted you, right? That's the knowledge. You have interpreted those words to be insulting, okay? What if I said, uh, what, no, what uh, about some other girl is insulting you? Oh, you're short. And maybe she's not very attractive. Is she insulting you or saying, oh, I wish I was cute and short like you? Right. So the knowledge is she insulted you. You heard words that are insulting. Only the knowledge. You don't have the truth of what she really feels or means. So you took the knowledge, you have your opinion, and you picked up the knife and stuck it in your own heart. But if she says, you're short, and insults you, and you say, yes, but I know that people are always in pain, they're jealous, they're envious, of anything, it doesn't matter who you are, they're envious of something. Or they're just wishing their life were different and they think you've got it better. So knowing that's a fact, because you watch when you insult people, you see where you get it from, what motivates you. Knowing that's a fact, you can say, okay, now I have the knowledge, the word. I have the vision, she looked angry. 
But the truth is, she's probably jealous or unhappy with her life. So going from the truth, it's a compliment. So why should I be angry at a compliment? Okay. So the more often we analyze thinking logically like this, observing, and you don't have to observe only people attacking you, you observe other people attacking each other, right? The more you observe that, the more it sinks into your mind to do the process quicker. Eventually it becomes so fast that no matter what anyone says, you hear the truth. You don't even go through the steps. Right? It's like a super fast phone versus a very ancient slow phone or internet. All right? It happens instantly by repeated practice of watching people arguing All right? and seeing where does it really come from. So every insult is generally jealousy, envy. I wish I had your life because watch yourself looking at other people and thinking, oh, they have this, it's better than mine. They are better than me. I wish I was like them. I wish I had what they have, right? Do y'all do that? Envy of other people? Thinking someone has something better than you that you wish you had? Kind of a normal thing. It could be a famous person. It could be someone you know, whatever. So observe how you are doing that. And then you'll start to see how everyone else is doing that. And then every insult becomes a compliment. Because you'll see that somewhere they're jealous of you. Now, the beauty of this is that the more you now reprogram yourself to think like that, even when they insult you and they mean to insult you, your mind sees it as a compliment. Because we're robots. The thing is, who programmed you? Somebody else. But now, you can destroy that program and reprogram yourself. So to me, I know I am good and smart and short and bald and whatever I am. But anytime someone says anything to me, I always hear jealousy, envy. They wish they could be like me. I hear automatically, I hear they're in pain and they're suffering. Okay? So that is my program now. That's why I cannot be insulted. It's impossible to, get, to make me feel insulted or to manipulate me or make me feel guilty. It's impossible to do that to me because my program is taking everything as instantly. Everybody is suffering. I've assumed that. Every human being. So I know it. Anything you say against me, I think you're envious. And that way you don't get upset so you don't have to respond negatively. Yeah, and it's actually kind of fun sometimes because if someone is insulting you, you go, thank you. It's really quite fun. If somebody is that, you go, oh, okay, thank you. All right. Or you just smile. You don't say anything. Uh, they eventually will calm down. They'll get a little bit irritated, um, but then they calm down because they cannot get the ball coming, right? The ball hits, all the balls are there, and this one doesn't move. If this one doesn't move and swing out and come back, that one can't keep going. It stops right there, right? So does that answer you? Yeah. So it's basically not something you just do now, but you get in the habit of always seeing people as suffering. Now, you don't need to be seeing or in an argument to do that, right? You, you, you just do that right now. Every human being, look at them and imagine the suffering in their life. Anyone who's serving in the restaurant, the security guards, the Uber drivers, you can imagine that whatever you want to imagine, the suffering's in their life. Okay? So going forward, every single human being you see, look at them and think of their sufferings. What about the people who are ill or handicapped or blind? Okay? Rich people, super rich people. I have one friend here. He's a super rich and famous guy in Kenya. And the guy's so depressed. Why is he depressed? Everybody loves him. Why? He pays for everything. <laughs> you know, they are around him. They get to be with famous people. 
right? He doesn't have the friendships. Rich people are like that. Why do the rich and famous movie stars, actors, singers, all these people commit suicide? Because you think, wow, they have everything, right? Um, no, they're all suffering. There was one, I, don't, I haven't seen her stories here, Kate Spade. She's a designer, big brand name, luxury brand. And she sold her company. She was worth, I think, $150 million at the time. She had her uh, a 13-year-old daughter, but the husband wanted to leave her, and she committed suicide. So she is, they said her net worth was over $150 million US, super rich, famous. You know, she's a luxury brand anywhere else in the world. You'll see Kate Spade shops. Um, but she killed herself. So rich, famous, successful, they're suffering too. Okay? So everybody you see, look at, think, what are they suffering? What is their pain? Okay? The more you do that, the more you'll have compassion, and the less anybody's attack can hurt you. Everything is habitual. You are a robot. You will always be a robot. Hopefully, I mean, one day you can become a Buddha and fully freed. But until then, you are a robot. The power you have is to reprogram that robot instead of the program you currently have. All right. So is that, is that a good answer? It's a long answer, but yeah, okay. All right, any other question? It's good. Yeah, everyone at once. You'll all get a turn. Okay. You could, if you change the environment, you could take your program with you. Doesn't mean you change it. So basically, you change your program in any environment by seeing the original cause, seeing what's really happening with the truth. So you can stay in the same environment where your parents are putting you down, your siblings are putting you down, everything, everyone says you're the black sheep of the family, you're a failure. You can stay in that environment and now start to observe for the truth instead of the knowledge or the vision and say, what is their pain and suffering? Okay? One friend, uh, all the siblings were corporate workers. She was a corporate worker. Everyone's got high corporate level jobs here in Kenya doing very, very well. She said, no, you know what? I've had enough of this. I want to leave the corporate world and do my art. I won't say what it is, you know. Don't want to say who's who, right? But she wants to do her, her art. We'll call it that. So that's it. Oh boy, the family has been attacking her constantly. How could you do that? You're so stupid. How could you leave the good corporate job to do this? You're not making much money. You're struggling. He said, but this is what I love to do. And now her self-esteem is hurt. Her confidence is hurt. And she cannot really succeed. Because she didn't change the way she sees them. She saw herself as a failure because she lived with the knowledge and the vision, which is, my siblings are telling me I'm bad, therefore I'm bad. But after we talk, I said, well, look, they're jealous. They wish they could leave this nine-to-five corporate job to be free, to do whatever they want, to work when they want, to do what they love. They're jealous. I'm thinking like that. So in the same environment, she changed the way she saw from knowledge and vision to truth, which is they're envious and wished they had the courage, and that changed her. You see? It's the same as me when I was 28 and I retired. Everyone is telling me, are you crazy? You're building an empire here. You have to keep growing. You're growing so quickly. You build the business. No, no. No, okay. So they all told me I'm crazy. Two years later, I get back to Montreal. The same people who said I was crazy said, oh, I wish I could do what you did. I'm so envious. And so the rest of my life, all the people who thought I was crazy to quit, I said, oh, you've traveled a hundred countries. You enjoy your life. No stress. I wish I could do. All right? So that's the thing. You've got to see the truth, which is their envy, jealousy, and even in the same environment. So it's not the environment that changes, but you who changes the program of how you interpret events around you. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. 
Okay. More question? You can't heal where you got hurt? What do you mean? Well, more like uh, you have to put hard time with trauma and things like that. Uh, so, the way you're saying, you can't see, or rather you can't change your environment, so you need to reprogram yourself to have to see the environment. So. They're saying you have to say, okay. So, and they say you have to forgive the person who hurt you, right? Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah, yeah, people who are hurt will hurt, yes. I'm, that's what I said. Everyone is in pain. And when you're in pain, you will attack. Just like any animal that feels you're attacking it, it will attack back out of self-preservation. Yes. So I don't believe in forgiveness. I don't believe in resentment. Because if you want to forgive them, you are assuming that they did that intentionally. Right? But what about my student whose kid washed his cameras in the water? Should he forgive the kid or does he just understand the kid didn't know different? Yeah, he didn't know. The kid couldn't help himself because he doesn't understand, right? When you, someone is having an operation and the patient dies in the operation, do you say the doctor is a murderer? No, the intention was good. So does the patient or the family need to forgive the doctor? His intentions were good, right? It just didn't work. So when we say you must forgive them, that has to come with an assumption they did it intentionally. But if we are all robots, and we have no control over our actions, and we are in pain and suffering, and we cannot control the way we vent, did that action really come from intention or a lack of ability to control and deal with their pain, and you're just the unlucky one who got it? Now, I know there are some horrible things people do, right? So I'm talking really on the level of verbal abuse, pretty much, all right? So emotional pains of that sort. So we have to think, rather than saying, I forgive you, which is saying, I'm better than you, you're not a good person, you hurt me, you're a bad person. Rather than that, I say, you're out of control. You have no ability to control yourself. You're a broken machine who has no ability to do anything with wisdom. So how can we expect you to do anything differently? Now, then I say, what harm was done? You put the knife on the table. I picked it up. I took it and stuck it in my own heart. So who's at fault is whoever programmed me to pick up the knife? In a way, right? But if I knew I could leave that knife on the table and not take the insults and the manipulation but be immune to that, I would not have been hurt, right? So if I didn't get hurt, I don't have to forgive you. I see you like the baby peed in the diaper. The baby messes the diaper. You clean it, 20 minutes, clean up the baby, put a new diaper, and as soon as you tie the last bow, <laughs> fills it again, right? What timing? What are you gonna do? Take it back, it's defective. Return the baby, spank it, punish it, flush it down the toilet, no. It has no control, right? So here's a big mistake humans make. You assume that because a person is so many years old, has so many PhDs, has so much money, has so much experience, you assume that along with any of that, they have self-control, they have wisdom, they have intelligence. No, they're still no better than the baby who cannot control itself. All right, so when there is these emotional traumas, again, I'm not talking about physical, that's, we'd have to go deeper about that. 
But I mean, I know one girl, she was um, sexually abused constantly when she was young, except she has no trauma from it. She says, it felt good. That's what she said. She said, nobody told me it was wrong and it felt good. Now, that's a very interesting thing because we, if you're physically hurt, okay, that's another story. But if you're not physically hurt by something and you don't know that it's wrong, could you be hurt and have a trauma? No. Okay? So everything is in a matter of how you have interpreted it. You interpret it because you've learned. My niece, when she was, I think, 14 or something, I was visiting, and she came out with some, she said, I don't know why she said it, but she said, one night stand, that's the best way to go. Wow, 14 years old, and she's saying, one night stands, that's the way to go, best. Okay, weird. Now, she likes watching these soap operas with my mother in the afternoon. And uh, I think it was the same day or the next day on the soap opera, this teenage girl is telling her mother and her mother is talking, they're talking and they're saying, yeah, one night stands, that's the best. So she learned from watching TV. Okay? So you learn what is good and bad through your environment. And because of that, when events happen that you are told are bad, you get emotionally traumatized. My father beat me regularly for no reason whatsoever. I have no trauma, I have no resentment, no regret. Why? Because I could see he's not hitting me. Something is wrong with this man. He's crazy. But I didn't do anything wrong. I happen to be the smallest one around, so I'm easy to hit. But it's not me, so I didn't get any trauma from it. Okay? So we need to begin with the trauma happened in your own mind because of how you interpreted what happened. Then we have to say that person has no control over themselves and is in pain or is very badly programmed. So they're a robot out of control like a wild animal, right? And then what is there to forgive? Rather, I have to say, okay, that's an animal I don't want to hang around with anymore, but robots are robots. Having said that, I have to say that one of my, I had one hour photo stores and that's a big machine with a computer and processes photos and one machine was broken so many times for nine months I couldn't get it to work properly, I punched it. So, you know, you can say a robot is a robot, how can you get angry at a robot? But yes, I got so angry, frustrated with a machine that would not work, I punched the machine. Okay. So yeah, we can get traumatized by certain events, but we have to then understand what really is behind it, okay? So um, yeah, so I, I think wherever you are with the person, without the person, if it's physical, if they're stealing money from you, if it's something like that, then don't associate with the person anymore. But my, my parents, both my parents stole a lot of money from me on, on several occasions, yeah. I mean, I, I really didn't have great parents. Yeah, definitely not great parents. Um, and one time, yeah, I, I lost all my money after one of my businesses was taken over by the government. And I lost everything and I was desperate to make money. And I had about $18,000 agreed to. I was doing a little business like a broker for my mother. And at the last moment, she screwed me <laughs> and took the money. Not even for herself, gave it to somebody else. Right? So yeah, they screwed me both. So what do I think? I think, oh, I'm traumatized. My parents cheated. My father stole money from me on three or four occasions. Um, and then I could be traumatized. But I think in their mind, they're desperate. They're scared. And they took where they could take. But it's not personal. I happen to be the easiest victim. Okay, so that was a lot of answering. Did I get anywhere close to answering your question? Yeah. So we just let them go as unconscious robotic animals who have no self-will, no intelligence, no wisdom, just like a snake in the field. Um, okay, if a snake bites you because you stepped on its tail, uh, or whatever you call the end part of a snake, um, 
you're angry, yes. You're in pain, yes. You're suffering, yes. But do you say you did that on purpose? It's a very different kind of emotional pain when you're suffering from being inflicted with the snake bite and the venom versus saying, you did that on purpose. You're evil. With that kind of resentment, you see the difference of your pain, how you can feel pain, how it can hurt you, or how you can just deal with it. So when the snake bites you, you're angry, but you immediately go to take care of the wound. You don't chase and yell at the snake, saying, how could you do that to me? Because you understand. That's what animals do. So your human mistake is assuming that other humans are better than just animals in the wild. Well, they're not. If they were, they wouldn't have done bad things. <laughs> it's really a simple test, isn't it? If we really were better than animals, we would never lie, cheat, steal, hurt, do all these evil things if we were better than animals. So see them as they are, the truth, not just the knowledge or the vision, you're in a human body, therefore you're different than a wild animal. You see, you stopped at the vision, human body, therefore should know better. Uh -uh. Truth, wild animal, no conscience, in pain, doesn't give a damn about anyone except itself. And it doesn't care who it hurts. So it's an animal, treat it like an animal. Don't try to pet the cobra. All right? And so when we accept truth, you can't get hurt. You might get robbed, but you can't get hurt emotionally. So emotional pain is caused by living in knowledge and vision and assuming by placing um, qualities onto another person that simply they don't deserve. So it's your fault. So that's why I don't believe in forgiveness. Because your pain is maintained by maintaining the wrong opinion. But if now I correct my mistake in thinking they should have known better, why did they do this to me? Correcting it to say, well, they're a selfish wild animal who doesn't care and think. Now that I correct my view, now if I continue to feel pain, it's my own self-pity sticking the knife because now I know the truth about why it happened. So that's where the change is. So that's why I don't believe in forgiveness. Yeah. Beats you yes. physically. Yes. Okay. That's an example. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So when I come here and you talk and everything, I'm like, I'm okay, I'm going to do it, and you know, I'm afflicted. But then the minute I get into the house, I'm just, it gets back into this part of your brain is broken by your husband. Yeah. So I think that's why it was asked, do you need to be in the same environment because you know the children will get changed? You know, I, I get the idea of, yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll change one person. But it's very easy to go back to 100% when I go back home because of that. Of yeah. The triggers, yeah. But do you know what's interesting about women who get beaten by their husband? They, if they leave, they find another guy who beats them. Yes, that's, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't matter whether you change the environment or not. You are the problem. The guy goes to the doctor. He says, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, so don't do that. <laughs> All right? So if... You have a husband who beats you. Learn martial arts and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Defend yourself. But if you're going to put up with it, then whose fault is it? And if you will justify putting up with it, which is something we get to later in the model, why we do that, okay? Or how we do that and how to fix that, okay? So, yeah. That's why it, it, changing the environment without changing yourself just means you'll repeat the same events again and again. 
I, I mean, there was one, she said, why do I always attract men who are afraid of commitment? She says, every man I meet is afraid of commitment. And I said, well, I don't know if it's every single man you meet that you're attracting. Is something wrong with you that makes them not want to commit to you? Right? Because you can't consistently attract 10 men in a row who are all afraid of commitment. There's got to be something you're doing. So all my work is, you're the only one in the universe. We don't change anybody else. You only change yourself. And if you change yourself, then how, what happens to you will change. Right? It's the same as like with, I said my father would beat me all the time, right? And then I think I was 14, 15 years old, and he was taking a whack at my head. And I don't know why, because I never learned martial arts or anything, but all of a sudden I went like this, to, like he was hitting me, right? And I just put my arm up to block him. And he just, he's like this. He never, ever touched me again. That was the only time I defended myself. He never touched me again. So you see, it's you who has to change. So that's why our work is only about you. You're the only one who changes. Yeah. Does that good or we can, I mean, more question about it? Unfortunately, your mind can take unlimited amount of self-inflicted pain and suffering. So it's entirely up to you when you decide enough is enough. Um, and that comes with self-esteem. When you feel that, no, I deserve better, I don't deserve this. Because if you have low self-esteem, you'll feel you deserve the abuse, so you'll stay with it. And you can take it for eternity. I mean, if you want to know what can a human mind take, do you know about the Holocaust in Germany? Yeah. The, the Jews in the concentration camps? Mm -hmm. Ever hear stories like that? I mean, the, the sufferings they endured and they still lived through it. A human being can take unlimited pain and suffering. So it's entirely up to you when you've had enough. That's why when I see people who repeat the same mistakes in their misery, I don't have compassion for them. I don't care. Hey, you, you know, you want to stay the same. That's your choice. Yeah. So it's entirely up to you. So a couple of things. If your self-esteem is low, then you will stay with trouble. Okay? So improve your self-esteem. That'll give you to see, no, you know what? I'm worth more than this. That's one way. Second thing is somebody who you can trust and respect to encourage you to change. Okay? So here's the reason why people don't get into business. They hate their job, they want to do a business. They never do it. And the reason is they're too scared that if I do it and I fail, who's going to help me fix the problem? So most things in our life we will not do if there is a risk factor, if we feel that there's no one there to catch us or help us get out of a problem if we get into trouble. So that's another way to help you change. Yeah. I hope I'm not causing a divorce here. Well, maybe I, I, I hope I am. I mean, maybe I should. I have caused divorces before. And then they've, all, they've both gone off and had happy lives after that. I've actually, yes, I've, I've had some students and they asked me to help them with their marriage. And I said, you should divorce. You're terrible together. You should divorce. And then they did divorce. And then they both had happy lives after that. So um, yeah. You know, I mean, we, we, we choose for the wrong reasons. So that's part of what the programming is. Why do we choose to get that person? Why do we choose to have a baby? Why do we choose this job? Because you're programmed to believe that's the right thing to do. So our work is to get you out of that programming. Yeah. Do you need a toilet break or a drink break or something? And then we'll talk a little more. Is that a good idea? Okay, go. Toilet's in the corner. Five o'clock, three, one and a half. Okay. 
All right. So, is that helping at all? Yeah? But you have to remember, everything is your fault. It's always your fault. If you have a business and your employee screws up, it's your fault. No question. It's the owner's fault. Why? You didn't train them well enough. You didn't watch them well enough. You gave them something to do beyond their capacity. It's always the boss's fault. So everything in your life is your fault. I like this, a Chinese saying, there's no bad children, only bad parents. Yeah. Having said that, um, my friends have a son and, uh, and the boy was like really not a, a little bit rude. They're Americans in California, a little bit rude. But the boy is like nine years old, I think at the time, never says thank you, never says please. And he went out to his friend and I said, Alan, how is this? You guys, you're so polite, so respectful. How is it your son isn't? They said, you know, we have tried so hard, but he goes to his friends, he plays the video games, he watches TV and movies. We can't fight that. Or in school. He said, there's too much external influence for the parents to teach him good manners. So you do have, you know, outside factors as well, but you have to do your best. So if you have a kid, the best is raise them in a bubble. Lock them in the room, never let them out, never let them see a computer or a TV. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, there is a control, you know, I think parents could have, um, you know, to some degree. So. All right. If you were there, she went out the front door. Okay. Is she gone, gone, or is she coming back? What's the guess? Phone. Okay. All right. Okay. So shall we continue? Just do a little bit more for maybe half an hour or so? Yeah? Okay. But any more questions so far? It's all good? All right, so I'll do a little bit more. Now we'll start on the model and uh, on the machine, right? So a human is a machine. You're made of parts. Those parts are all broken. I have to show you how the parts should function, how they got broken, and how to repair them. In a car, you've got steering, brakes, windows, transmission, exhaust, all these parts. And if one part is broken, the whole machine doesn't work. If all the parts are broken, for sure the machine doesn't work. So you need to know how to fix the parts in order for the machine to work well. Okay? So I'll now start with the model of the parts of the machine. Okay? The first part is events. You have five senses. Everything is an event. Every smell, taste, sound, touch, everything. So that's the basic. Right now, all five of your senses are receiving events, but your conscious mind cannot process every sound you hear, everything you're looking at, everything you smell, whatever it is. But your subconscious is processing it. You may not know what you're looking at when you're, looking, when you're walking outside. For example, you're walking on the street you don't see everything, but your eyes see it, right? Your eyes still see everything because it's a mechanical organ, but your consciousness isn't processing everything, right? Okay, so that's the first principle. Everything is an event. Now, as every event happens, what you do is you identify that event. So now our next part of the machine is identification. So the first part is our five senses through our physical body, registering events. Now we identify them. Now is where the brain comes in and it says, is this good, bad, safe, dangerous? 
What is it? What do I do with it? Do I eat it? Do I smell it? Do I ignore it? Right? Is it going to be dangerous? So, a baby sees a snake and it goes, oh, what's that? Right? And then, mommy and daddy screams like a banshee and goes crazy and says, no, bad, 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 bad. That event created the identification that snakes are bad. Be scared. And from now on, that child will be petrified of snakes. Right? Okay. So this is how it goes. So now as an adult, that now child is a now adult and is scared of snakes. Anytime they'd see a snake or there's the potential of a snake, that person is going to get scared, right? Identification. So every event happens when it reaches your five senses, it goes into your brain, it looks in the memory to identify fire is dangerous, don't put your hand in there because I did it before and it hurt, and it says don't do that, or this is good, do that, okay? So your instincts drive you, your animal instincts drive you. You want a hug, you need a kiss. All these things are an event Something is there that triggers the desire, then the identification of this is good, I want it, because it makes me feel good, and I do. Now, Buddha said to the monks, all the men, when you go out of the Sangha, the community, the, 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 the school, monastery, whatever you want to call it, always look down at the ground. Never look up. Always look at the ground. When I was a monk too, they always said, you go out, you look at the ground. Why? Because the sexual desire is very strong. And a monk is not supposed to have sex, not supposed to make babies. So what happens when you look and see, you want. But if I don't look, I don't see, I don't want. Correct? How many times have you not wanted ice cream or coffee, and then you saw the ice cream shop or the coffee shop, and as soon as you saw it, wow. Right? So you are completely controlled by events beyond any ability you have to resist that identification which creates a desire. By the same token, this story of one of my students who did this course a couple of times, and then after this, because you, so a lot of students, they do it three, four, five times because you learn more each time, you know, because it's a lot to understand. She said, Damn, now I know what happened. She said, I was dating this guy and he's perfect. This guy was successful and handsome and wonderful and, you know, every attribute you want. He was perfect and he loved me and he was perfect. But I broke up with him. Why? She says, now I know why. She said, he wore a particular kind of shoes. And he just loved those shoes. But every time he came over, he took off the shoes. I saw those shoes. I just got a bad feeling about him. And I never knew what it was. But every time I saw those shoes, I just got a bad feeling. And you know what they say. If you got a bad feeling and you don't really know what it is, it's a danger. Run away. Right? That's what they tell you, isn't it? When you get a bad feeling, if you really have a bad feeling about something, that's telling you something, isn't it? Right? So after she learned this course and we got to identification, she said, uh-huh. What happened was a previous boyfriend wore exactly the same shoes and that bastard cheated on me. And now I know what the feeling was. It's the feeling of being cheated on. But since this new guy was so loyal and loving and wonderful, the bad feeling wasn't understood as he's cheating on me, because he wasn't. But she just got the bad feeling and she lost the best man she ever had in her life. She sent him away, broke up with him. Because the identification happens. When I see something, I identify the emotion 
to the first time I saw it. And so, I see you today. No, I, I'm near you today. I go on a date with you today, okay? I go on a date with you today, and you're wearing a perfume that is from my first love who broke my heart. And I just have a bad feeling about you. It's our first date. I don't know you too well, but no, I don't, I don't like you. I just have a bad feeling. Because the, the perfume reminded me of the first time I smelt that perfume. Or a song. Have you ever been out talking, having nice time, everything is good, then you hear a song and all of a sudden your mood changes. Because that song was your first kiss or your first breakup or God knows what happened. You were listening to that song, it was your favorite song, you were singing while you were driving and you had an accident. And now that song brings up fear and a memory of the accident. Okay? So, Next exercise for you is to watch identification. Whenever your mood changes, whenever your thoughts jump, try to see which one of your five senses, what event triggered the change which would be reminding you of something in the past. Okay? What, when, you know, everything is cool and then you think of the coffee, ah, because I saw the coffee. And I know what coffee smells like, tastes like. I know what I like. Um, so, watch how, be more attentive to anything that reaches one of your five senses and watch how your moods change. Watch how your thoughts drift or you can't stay focused. Okay? So, um, yeah. Yeah, another one. I just keep a couple of notes for myself here. I love to play badminton. And every time, I, do you play, if you play badminton, you'll know sometimes you're very close to the net and the opponent is close to the net. So the two of you are close to the net and you can, you know, the, the, the bird, the shuttle is high and you can smash down, right? Or you can hit it. So the defense move is to have your racket up. So in case, you know, they smash, it hits your racket if you're lucky and goes back. Okay? Anytime I would get close to the net and close to my opponent and my opponent raised his racket, I would cower. I would just like a cower. I'd drop to the floor and cower. You know, everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. I thought I was crazy. And that's all the time. Very bizarre. No understanding why. I mean, he's on the other side of the net. He's just, you know, it's badminton. And one day, I'm at the net, and he was there, and I saw my father with his slipper. He used to like to beat me with his wooden slipper. And I, like, you know how you have these flashes, right? And the opponent was there, I saw my father with his slipper. And I went, aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, I caught the identity, but it went years! You know, but this is when I'm younger, before I'm doing too much of the work on myself. Um, and that's it. It finally came out. And never did I cower again. Then I was free of that. But you see, how many things that you fear, you jump, you're nervous, your mood swings, something goes wrong, you get a bad feeling. It's identification that you may not remember. All right? So... Remember how I said every negative emotion, think, where did you learn it, who was like that, things like that. Now, it's the same thing. Try to find with every negative feeling where is the first time you experience something similar and what are you identifying it to. So that you, and now you have to say, um, I'm with you, you wear that perfume, it's our first date. And I smell that perfume and I just get a bad feeling about you. Okay? So unconsciously, I'll walk away. I'll say, mm, you know, oh, oh, sorry, forgot I have an appointment, break our date. Right? Or now I know I have a bad feeling about you. I smelt the perfume and I got a bad feeling. I understand how the machine works. I understand how events trigger identification, which puts me in the mood of the first time I experienced it. 
Now that I know how the machine works, I can stay with you. And I don't have to leave just because of that perfume which changed my mood. And I can return my mood to being present rather than what it was in the past. Okay? So this first part of the machine will give you a tremendous power not to be manipulated by your feelings, your negative feelings, your bad feelings, not to be manipulated. And now you just go forward cautiously. Don't be stupid, of course, but you can go forward cautiously, but you don't have to, no, no, bad feeling, run away. Because they all tell you, if you have a bad feeling, it means something. Yes, like that, everything happens for a reason. Yes, there's a reason, you have a bad feeling, but the reason is somebody else, something else. My father, when, when he was in Montreal, he had some money, he started a first business, you know, a business for himself, auto mechanics, car repairs, petrol station. And then uh, a couple of years later, it's doing well, and he's busy. he had a business partner, and the business partner embezzled all the money and ran, left my father bankrupt. Okay? So therefore, after that, he said, never, ever, ever do business. Never do business. Never invest money. Get a job, just save your money. Never do business. Because that's his identification, all right? Thank God I know he's an idiot and I never listened to him, right? So one example is, I was 20 years old. I was a property broker, real estate broker. And I got an opportunity, I bought an apartment building. The whole, in Montreal, you buy the whole building. Uh, it's not like everyone owns their apartment. One person owns the whole building. 13 apartments. I bought the whole, I'm 20 years old. I bought a building with 13 apartments. My father said, you're gonna lose all your money because of his identification to business and investment, right? You're gonna lose all your money. I sold it less than a year later. I made like an $80,000 profit, huge profit. It only cost me 130, so it's a massive profit. And uh, his comment is, now you're gonna pay a lot of income tax. Why? Because his identification to business is it's bad, you shouldn't do it. So therefore, everything about it is bad. Even the profit is bad, okay? So watch every thought you have, every negative thought you have, every mood swing, every opinion, when anyone is talking to you about something, all right? For example, Africa. I wouldn't come to Africa. I, first time I came to Africa was in 2019. You know why? I ran out of other countries. <laughs> I'd been everywhere else in the world. But I would never have come to Africa because TV, stories, oh, my friends went to Africa and got killed and they got robbed, and they got disease, and the snake bit them, and the lion ate them, and all of these terrible things about how dangerous Africa is. And so every time the thought of going to Africa, fear, panic, uh, robbed, attacked, killed, disease, everything you can think of. Come on, where is that? <laughs> In Nairobi, a lion should eat me? No, right? But I believe so, because you're going to Africa, it can happen. And many people still believe this, you see? So I understand my fear is identification, so I go anyway, even though I have the fear. And the first trip I was going to stay, I, I did safari in Kruger and Botswana and Namibia, and I was gonna stay four or five days in Cape Town, I stayed six months, because I loved it, it was great, you see? So you don't know what will happen if you will not give in to your identification and fears, it could lead you to wonderful things, you see? So, watch for that. Anytime someone is talking to you, every conversation you have, listen what they're saying and watch your opinions that pop up and see if this is an identification that you've heard something like that in the past, and that has brought your opinion, okay? So either it's somebody else in your family, your upbringing, 
or your identification with that thing. So especially in one-to-one -one interactions, job, anything to do with jobs, careers, opportunities, it's too good to be true, therefore don't touch it. Hey, maybe it is too good to be true. I mean, the deal I had on that apartment building, for example, that was too good to be true. That was an amazing deal because the, the guy who owned the building, I, I took the pictures at his son's party one many years earlier. He liked me, so he wanted to give me a chance. So he gave me a deal that was too good to be true. So anyone would say, oh no, it's too good, it's a trick, right? So they don't take it. And I'm like, no, it's a good deal. So job opportunities, investment opportunities. Think, don't be stupid. But watch if your identification is bad. I believe uh, cryptocurrencies are bad. No, I won't touch it. Uh, I was with some friends who invest in it when Bitcoin was 16,000, 16,000. And she's telling me, oh, it's the bottom now, it's going up from here, it's great. And I said, no, 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 I, I don't believe in cryptocurrencies, absolutely not. It's gone up to 75,000. <laughs> what a deal I missed, right? So you see how identification and opinions without saying, I only have knowledge and not looking deeper can cost you your whole life and future. Then what, what is your life about? You see? So when you complain about your life, limited this, I don't have money, don't have job, don't have good man, don't have good woman, don't have whatever. So remember, this is your own fault, all right? So um, now you'll start watching. Mood swings, the identification. Look for it when you go in the shopping mall, things you see, the music will play, uh, smells, whatever. Watch how your memories jump. Watch for it. Don't just let it jump without watching like you're uh, daydreaming. Start paying attention. And basically, everyone says, so how do I change it, right? You're saying, so how do I not react that way? By observing how you do react. That's how we change, okay? You will stop identifying by watching how you identify all the time, by seeing it happen. So my method is a Buddhist method. Um, Western method is get more tools, get more work, get more practices, get more exercises, right? That's what they're teaching you. Buddha said, just stop doing what's bad. It's very simple. So my work is stop doing, don't do this. Okay? Stop doing what is causing the problem. So at this level, we've shown you many things that you do that's causing the problem coming down to explaining about events and identification. And if we start watching how we do it, you won't do it because you're not that stupid. The reason you do things that hurt you is because you don't know what you're doing. Does that make sense? Because if you knew that putting your hand in the fire was going to burn you, you wouldn't do that again. But if you have a problem with your memory and every time you burnt your hand, you forgot that fire burns, you would keep burning your hand. So you can only stop doing it when you see that you accept responsibility for your actions and that you yourself are doing this to you through this broken machine. Make sense? Okay? All right, so I don't want to go further um, because enough is enough, right? How much can I stick in your head? Uh, you have plenty of things to think about and to start observing. So you observe all the things I've told you. I'm going to load the video onto YouTube. Uh, is it YouTube or do you want to be able to download it or just watch it on YouTube? Or I can do both. Both? You have a choice. Okay. So I will load that up. Um, yeah, this evening anyway. And on the group chat, I will send you the links for that uh, so you can review it. So for these four sessions, you really have to put a lot of time, you know, between each session. 
doing what I said, observing, observing, and then you'll develop questions and a deeper understanding, okay? So that we can go further. And then it gets more interesting, like as we get to the next, the next session, all right? So more questions? And you can email me, text, I mean, text questions anytime, right? All right. Um, so we can still start at 3 and finish about 5.30. Or we can start later and finish later. Or what is good? Still start? Huh? Okay. So we'll still start at 3 and we'll finish before 6, for sure. Okay. I think the one who suggested, say, 3 till 7, I remember she was saying, because they won't show up till 4. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, all right. So that's good. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So we're done for this. And, yeah, no questions. Anything? I can sit here, drink my water while you think. I'm supposed to ask you to do something. They tell me that I'm supposed to say, ask questions, make them do something, participate. But I prefer that, you see, my, my life is, okay, imagine the farmer has 100 sheep. And he's happy, he's got 100 sheep. One sheep realizes, you know, we're all about to be slaughtered next week, so he escapes. And the farmer's not happy, he's got 99 sheep, but he's still okay. But then the one sheep comes back, explains it to the other sheep, and they all leave. Now the farmer's really not happy, right? So the world does not want smart, awakened people, right? My interest is in people who really want to master their life, who want to really change and become free and successful and happy, and get anything you want, right? So for that, you have to be putting in the effort. All right, so that's why I don't make it easy like Tony Robbins and all these with all their fancy fun stuff and make it exciting and get you dancing and that. Tony Robbins, by the way, they've, they've worked out scientifically the room temperature, the background music, the type of chairs. I mean, they've really made it an environment so people are jumpy. Um, I, I don't want to do that. I want to see if you, I mean, it's up to you to choose to be desperate enough that you really want to make a change in your life. So you put in the effort. So I don't make it all that easy on you. I give you everything. I'm here for every question, anything you want to know. But I want people who really want to, you know, put in the effort to, to, to do the work themselves. So that's why I'm not... Yeah, I'm waiting. You have questions? Good. Okay. All right. So if that's it, you don't have anything to say, you can go or you can stay, whatever you like. All right. Okay. So I'll stop the recording then.